Hello and welcome to MIDD Plus 2023. My name is Brett Howell and I'm the president of the Daily Sim Service Division at Simulations Plus. And I'm excited to share a brief talk today that focuses on career path design for QSP and QST modeling scientists. I hope to accomplish three main goals today with this brief talk. The first is to get you excited about QSP and QST modeling and simulation as a career field, as an exciting and growing area to work in. Second is to give you some tangible action steps and how you can do that, how you can move into this space, whether you're very early in your educational journey or whether you're already into your career of another choice. And lastly, I hope to talk a little bit about maybe what the future holds for QSP modeling. Quantitative systems pharmacology is, is a rewarding, fulfilling, and growing career opportunity to pursue. Um, I'll define what QSP is throughout this presentation, but in short, it's using math to understand biological problems and systems. It matters because it has impact, and I'll highlight some of those impacts. The modelers that get into this space tend to come from a variety of backgrounds and areas, and there are several action steps you can take to migrate into this area. And overall, the future of QSP is bright. At the end of the presentation today, I'll also go through a few frequently asked questions and discuss some of my opinions on those uh, questions. So let's quickly compare quantitative systems pharmacology or toxicology modeling and simulation with pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic, which is PKPD modeling and simulation. Traditional PKPD modeling typically uses statistical mathematics to infer relationships from clinical data. This conceptually can be thought of as a top-down approach where you take a data set that has lots of information in it, um, in, in some cases fairly large clinical data sets, and you use statistics and modeling approaches to piece apart that data and determine which aspects of that particular study or of those patients was driving certain outcomes or effects, whether it be exposure or PD or certain endpoints. We compare that with quantitative systems modeling. This is more like starting by thinking about each piece of the puzzle in a jigsaw puzzle and then building components so that ultimately as you build those components and put them together, you're actually from the bottom up building the prediction or the pro projection of what that jigsaw puzzle will look like. So if you think about it in that way, rather than having the jigsaw puzzle to start, having the full data set, you can actually work from the ground up and make prospective predictions with this type of modeling simulation. Of course, it requires a lot of grounds up, bottom up uh, work and understanding of fundamental processes. There are three key elements associated with both quantitative systems pharmacology, which is efficacy or drug effectiveness focused, or quantitative systems toxicology, which is the focus of safety and toxicity predictions. And I'll use those terms QSP and QST pretty much interchangeably. The three key elements really starts, first of all, with the fundamental mathematical representation of a particular disease state or area of interest. For example, um, there's a platform called IPF Sim that we developed at Simulations Plus. It's focused on the, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis disease, the fibrosis, the inflammation, the different components of that disease. It's the differential equation based mathematical representation of the lungs, the pulmonary system, and how that goes sideways in a disease state. We also have DiliSim, a focus of the liver and how it functions both in a healthy state but also in a non healthy state. So it really starts with taking a biological system and breaking it down into equations and a representation of that system. Next, we think about how does a specific therapeutic uh, protein or small molecule interact with the system, either through a pathway that can cause toxicity or a pathway that can lead to pharmacodynamic effects. And those are typically assessed in in vitro wet lab studies or in animal studies, and sometimes even in me very mechanistic clinical studies. That information allows you to now connect the basics of the biological system with the specifics of a compound or protein. And then lastly, you have to predict typically with PBPK modeling, which for us usually means Gastro Plus, our flagship product, predicting the exposure at the site of action or the site of potential toxicity. So you're actually predicting what's the concentration in the liver, in the lungs, or at the site of interest. So typical PBPK uh, QSP and PBPK modelers are focused on bringing these three areas together to ultimately predict and simulate if efficacy and toxicity for potential therapeutics.
Now, some tangible examples of platforms where this has been done in the past and built out would be our RenaSim kidney injury platform, our DiliSim liver injury platform, our NAFLDSim NASH and NAFL platform, and our pulmonary platforms, IPF and ILD SIM. So these platforms are examples where we've already built those fundamental core models, and you can go and really focus on the specific compounds and proteins and their exposures in terms of applications. So we understand QSP involves fundamental models, it involves specific um, interactions, proteins or small molecules and exposure, but why does it matter? Well, I'll go through a few case studies here just to show that QSP can have a huge and is having a huge impact um, in the world in terms of impact on decision making and critical outcomes for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. The first example I'll give shows that QSP and QST can provide confidence for safety decisions with biological rationale to really support and underpin that comp confidence. The example here is Biohaven. They were developing a treatment for migraine. They knew that a similar um, uh, sort of therapeutic targeted towards the same target, had uh, serious liver failures in the past from another company, so they really wanted to compare their compound with that fire, prior failure in a very objective way. That was done for them, and at the end of that process, they understood, oh, our compound is much safer for these very specific reasons. They, they approached that um, with confidence, they were able to get their drug approved. Ultimately, they the program was acquired by Pfizer for multiple billion dollars. So um, a success case where modeling and simulation gave confidence. Another example is where um, you want to understand mechanisms behind a certain uh, a certain action, whether it be PD or tox focused. In this case, uh, the paper I'm showing here focused on understanding why different macrolide antibiotic drugs or drug candidates had different ways of interacting with and potentially causing harm to the liver. And that information was used in a regulatory setting to try and explain why certain drug candidates were like other drugs and not other drugs, right? So it was a really a matter of organizing information in it using modeling and simulation to explain and understand mechanisms. Next, there are lots of questions around um, patient behavior, confounding and placebo effects. These are things that really confound a lot of clinical trials, especially in the NASH community, the NAFLD community, where um, there's some strange placebo effects. Modeling and simulation with NAFLD sim was able to show that perhaps the dieting patterns of the patients who aren't actually getting treated, but they're enrolled in the trials, maybe they're changing their dieting patterns to where they're losing weight, and then gaining it back, losing weight, gaining it back, and that can actually impact their fibrosis scores, which could explain why placebo groups in many NASH trials are seeing benefits. So a good way to use this quantitative method to try and explain difficult to understand outcomes. The, one of the big ones is predicting acceptable or unacceptable efficacy levels prospectively for new therapies. So here's an example presented at the liver meeting, again with NAFLDSIM, where a particular therapeutic um, was predicted to be um, not very eff efficacious for treating this disease. So you can use QSP modeling to prospectively say, let's pressure test our systems our solutions, our therapeutics, our competitors' therapeutics, and let's even, even pressure test combinations prospectively. Even though we know the models aren't perfect, they're informative as we translate all the data we have with these models to future predictions. You can also organize complex data sets into clearer conclusions. So there was a, um, a proposition to study acetaminophen's potential to cause carcinogenicity uh, from a regulatory agency. There was a lot of data out there to really try to uh, understand whether or not acetaminophen had any potential to cause cancer. Q quantitative systems toxicology modeling allowed for a way to organize that data into a very clear sequential set of steps and explain why that data suggested on the whole that acetaminophen does not cause cancer. Um, and actually in this case, the FDA submitted a letter to that same regulatory agency saying, hey, we agree acetaminophen does not cause cancer. We don't think it should be labeled in that way. So, um, you know, ways to evaluate and pull together information with modeling as the framework. And lastly, why does it matter? QSP matters because the FDA and other agencies are increasingly accepting and expecting submissions in certain situations when appropriate from these tools. In fact, there were around 60 FDA QSP submissions in 2020. So we're seeing a growing number of QSP submissions. And so regulators will begin to, to know and already know about these methods and will ask, can you put this in the context with the modeling approach? So QSP 
is an exciting discipline. It matters. It has an impact. How do you get into the field? Well, let's start by discussing some typical training backgrounds for careers in QSP. And if you're very early in your educational journey and you have a chance to choose what graduate area may I want to go into, this could be for you. Um, very important information. So engineering, a lot of QSP modelers come from a biomedical, chemical, mechanical, or otherwise um, even electrical, otherwise engineering background. Engineering, of course, allows for that focus on application and math. Um, applied mathematicians and physicists, also very common as QSP modelers. Um, and again, have that strong math background. Life scientists come in with emphasis on biologists, biochemistry, pathophysiology, and oftentimes, you know, work on catching up and, and really focusing on the mathematics as well over time. So that's another big area. And then last but not least, pharmaceutical scientists with a very wide variety of, of areas of emphasis in their um, uh, pharmaceutical scientist studies come into QSP and have, you know, maybe a little bit more handle on drug development um, uh, as a whole than some of the other disciplines. So each discipline has its own strengths, um, own set of weaknesses, but these are some of the some of the key ones, and there are many others as well. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but these are some of the areas where if you wanted to set yourself up for a QSP career, you could focus on getting a graduate degree in these areas. In general, it's important to know that what QSP really requires is knowledge of complex biological systems combined with knowledge of mathematics. So either side of that can be your starting place. Um, you know, you just know that regardless of which side you start on, you're going to have to work on over your career focusing on the other side as well. And it's those two things coming together that makes strong QSP modeling careers. So maybe you're um, in one of those tracks and wanting to move into QSP modeling as a career field, or maybe you're later in your career and want to migrate over to QSP. What are some tangible action steps that you can take? Well, first, obviously, as discussed, you can do your graduate research focused on mechanistic mathematical modeling problems in, an, in a biological area, um, and especially with an emphasis on therapeutic development. If you can find a graduate research group, they're not that common, but there are more and more popping up that does this type of modeling as a part of their research, that's a home run. That's almost a guaranteed path into QSP. But short of that, or even in addition to that, another very important element are industrial internships. And I strongly encourage everyone, inquire and apply and ask very often, at a number of companies as you're getting through starting your graduate work and working through about summer internships. A lot of companies are much more flexible and a much more available opportunities for internships than full time opportunities. So you can really get your experience and internships are a great way to segue into your ultimate, uh, you know, um, destination for your initial uh, role in QSP, uh, your QSP career. And then there's commercial software access. Take advantage of free commercial software access and training that's available to you as a graduate student, for example, and learn these platforms so that you can discuss them and understand what they do before you ever go into a job interview. And I'll just take a chance to plug here our, our University Plus program at Simulations Plus. We offer programs like Gastro Plus, Dilly Sim, um, AdMet Predictor, um, Monolix, and others for absolutely for no cost to academics for research and teaching and training. And you can really gain a leg up on others in this area by getting those programs and learning them and understanding them. And there's lots of free training videos and live training available. Also, as as with most things, surround yourself with the right people, with QSPers in the space, at technical meetings and societies and programming groups and regional chapters. Get to know those people, go to those meetings, and by doing so, that you will begin to understand the things that matter to them, and they will begin to recognize your name and your presence so that later on as you want to <clears throat> move into this as your career, they will, uh, you know, they will know and accept you into that um, in certain roles and, and, and positions. And lastly, do your homework on QSP literature and resources that are absolutely freely available online. It's astounding the amount of information through papers, webinars, posters, trainings, and regulatory guidances that you can get just by searching the internet, taking the time to read these papers, these case studies, these guidances. It will give you a huge leg up in talking with someone about moving into this career field or doing an interview. If you can say, I noticed that in this paper, this was the application. That application is exciting to me. I want to do work like that. You know, I want to know more about that. And that will have a huge impact um, as you go through the interview process. So you've you've trained, you've migrated. Now you're you're thinking of of of, of, of starting a QSP career or you're in the midst of your QSP career. What does daily life look like? 
Um, well, it involves extensive background research on diseases and biology. Um, that's something that you'll always have to do to really understand what you're modeling and why. It involves development of equations and models, but also testing and validation. And if, depending on the, the specified problem statement and depending on where you are in your uh, physically located in terms of or, or in terms of the company you're working for, you may be doing more validation versus development. But ultimately, that's a key part of the model process. And then there's the application, right? QSP modeling, by definition, arisen, arose out of the need for application. So really, it's about using the models to answer questions, analyzing those results and formulating them into conclusions and then presenting that. There's deliverable preparation, documents, slides and files. There's external communication with presentations and technical documents and regulatory formatting for those documents. There's stakeholder management. You have to think about all the people involved in, in the type of situation in which you're building your career and what matters to them and, and manage those relationships. And then there's personnel and contracts management. Oftentimes, in QSP, you'll be working your way into managing people. You'll also be managing relationships with either vendors or customers, and you need to think about contracts and how that all plays into the scientific process of modeling as well. And in some cases, if you're in biotech or pharma, you may work within a specific therapeutic development group and do other things in addition to sort of using QSP as one of your tool sets. You may also do software development, tool development, testing, and training. These can be parts of, especially if you're part of a commercial entity like Simulations Plus, where you may be developing software and tools. And then there's organizational management as you work your way up. So if you work your way into QSP modeling, um, how do you ensure that you'll grow and that you'll have a great career? Well, here's a few tips that I've learned, certainly not exhaustive, um, but just a, a few tips. Be committed to both sides of this discipline. Those who focus primarily on tools and quantitative sciences, but not so much on the disease areas, the areas of treatment, therapeutic benefit, don't do as well. If you're committed to both sides of the discipline, if you really apply yourself to both sides, that's a great recipe for success. Be collaborative. Remember, the community of QSP is small. You need to have good relationships with people. Work together when you can. Share when you can. Be a developer of therapeutics who uses QSP tools, not the other way around. Um, I think if you go into drug development, therapeutic development and say, I want to help get this stuff to patients. I want to be a developer. And oh, by the way, I have this great tool chest with me, which is QSP. That's a, a recipe for success. And then above all else, in terms of growing your career, constantly think about where you've actually had impact. People are most um, interested in scenarios where you played a part and there was a tangible impact on a decision of, or a path forward. And so, yes, the tools you developed, some of the details of that, they matter, but what matters more is the impact. And so look for those opportunities to have impact and then be able to amass that list of, of, imp of applications where QSP has had an, an impact and where you've been a part of that. So let's talk just for a moment about the future of QSP. I think in the future, we'll see QSP becoming more and more central to decision making. I think AI and QSP together will be a winning combination. AI is very powerful with the amount of data that we're generating as human beings um, and, and, and the ability to get our heads around that data. But QSP perfectly complements AI in that it allows us to provide biological plausibility, and that's certainly a, a required thing in many settings. I think you'll see more standardized uh, methods in QSP as regulatory guidances are issued. I think you'll see computational power continue to explode, and this will drive larger and larger analyses of larger and larger and more inclusive data sets. And so that's going to make it challenging for us to package those results in the right ways. I think QSP modelers will continue to be industry leaders and decision makers, and this will only spur more QSP work. So as we close out, just quickly, a few frequently asked questions. What is the typical starting title or level for a QSP scientist? Typically, um, entry level would be a postdoctoral fellowship where you're still learning and growing in a, in a first one to your project or a scientist one or two title where you're coming in and starting to do projects um, within a uh, you know pharma, biotech or consulting company right away. Um, what types of organizations can QSP scientists be employed by? Academic institutions, nonprofit institutions, pharma biotech companies, and then um, services and software providers like Simulations Plus, for example. Most important skills. In my opinion, it comes down to three most important skills. Number one, the ability to succinctly convey high impact information and being able to do it succinctly takes practice and it takes preparation. 
knowing the goals and drivers for the situations you're in. You could do a really, really good job, but if that particular um, application area of focus doesn't matter to your audience or to your customers, it doesn't matter so much. And then read the room. Make sure you understand in each situation what's appropriate, what's not, where the emphasis should be, and, and so forth. What types of technologies typically get used for QSP? Well, engineering programs like Julia and MATLAB are, are one side of the, the aisle, and then there are other uh, programs, base programs like C++, for example, where a lot of proprietary platforms and software tools get coded in C++. So there's some that are easier to write in if you're not a computer engineer and some that are more difficult. Both of, the, both of those types of technologies get used. So three of the most common ones we hear would be MATLAB, Symbiology, and um, and Julia in terms of engineering uh, tools. Is computer programming a required skill? Absolutely not, but it helps on the resume um, and in certain situations. Is QSP more applicable to smaller molecules or macromolecules? It's absolutely equally applicable to both. It, it certainly helps with macromolecules in certain cases where there's complexity that you could only address with things like QSP models. Um, and so equally applicable to both types of, of, of therapeutic um, options. And when is it too late to move into a QSP career? I would say never. Obviously, the later you move into the career, the more difficult it is to make that shift, but it's never too late to think about moving into QSP as a career opportunity um, and, and moving into that lane. So with that, thank you very much for um, this talk, and I hope you will consider a career in QSP modeling in the future.